We are living in the Holocene extinction period, scientists tell us, the sixth great extinction event on Earth as far as we know. In my life living off the land in down east Maine and working as an artist etching plants, animals, fungi, and natural systems on porcelain pottery supports this notion. I moved down east 10 years ago, shaping an intentional life out of mud and wood, rain and salt, and around the systems around me. I raised $7,000 at a tag sale where I sold all I owned so I could move to 11 acres of deep spruce, fir, and birch woods 300 yards from the ocean. For four months, I lived in a tarp city, kitchen cabinets, partner, two dogs, an axe, smokes, all things that made life a little bit easier. But it rained for two months straight. <laughs> it was the bugs that eventually drove us inside their frenzied whine audible through the walls of the 16 by 20 cabin I had built. I became acquainted with the rhythms around me as I foraged plants, mushrooms, or hunted, recognizing individual birds, discovering new to me species in a would-be backyard, and started to etch them on my pottery. I sat by the fire and listened to the rain as I sculpted in white porcelain, that with which I was becoming familiar. Eventually, I saw these individuals as parts of relationships. Those relationships fit together neatly into elastic, self-correcting systems. Systems hold the world up, keep turning it over. There is no real predator-prey relationship, no parasite or host, just competitive symbiosis. It was tumultuous, all of this bustling about in the constant search for food, shelter, water, sun, and salt. The weather, the waves, and the tides, those are the real masters of supply. My task as a forager largely consisted of paying attention to my surroundings and showing up on time. I followed pathways from resource to resource and discovered that these paths had been used for millennia by everyone else. Paths are lines from shelter to water to food and back to shelter again. The resources don't move much, and so the easiest routes are well known and well used. I started to become familiar with the seasons and how organisms move and express themselves. I could hear flocks of birds moving at night when I'd go up to my meadow, orienting by the stars, thrushes thrushes chattering in the clear, cold October air as I tried to see them through my breath. Things started to shift about five years into this relationship web. The fish came early or late or not at all. The rhythm started to resemble a top about to topple. In one spring, there were no smelts and no mackerel that August, and the lobsters came into shed in May instead of July. The birds waited for fish, too. I saw large numbers sitting in the river's mouths, right on time, waiting for the smelts, the elvers, and the alewives. We as humans have no yearly schedule of reproduction, and we can be flexible with what we eat but we have nothing in common with birds. All of this change started to pile up and started to become noticeable on my time scale. I started to feel like Noah must have, being gifted with knowing that the flood is coming and wondering how he's ever going to save all these animals and worrying for his friends and families after the flood. I now feel an urgency in my work. I'm a potter, one of the record keepers of humanity for some 20,000 years. Our entire recorded history is unbroken in pottery. Most potters see themselves, as do I, as carrying a tradition that compels us to create and thus record that which is important to us. On my pottery, I etch in a technique called scraffito, 6,000 years old itself, and a pure static historical medium. The things I etch today will last millennia, as were those recorded in Mesoamerica, in Asia and Africa millennia ago. Now my job is to be direct and understandable and clear and durable. So I etch about moving inside the house after being outside for so long and how I mourn the sounds, the smells, and the sights of the woods. I etch about how we sometimes wake up in a new place, a new life, and don't really know how we got there. I etch about the relationship between, my, between owls and my chickens about how the act of being seen causes the owl to become fierce and the hen scared. But until that time, an owl is just a scared bird hiding in a tree, trying to evade the ravens. I etch the life that emerges from the vernal pool once four-wheelers stop muddying the waters every spring. 
I record that dragonflies need salamanders, their nymphs eating the others. They both need clear water so they can see and hear and breathe. I etch how bumblebees pollinate daisy fleabane and lupins, how the anthill holes become covered with dew every morning as the underground water rises up and fogs their tunnels, and how that dew feeds the plants that hide brown snakes, so similar to cottonmouths, only tiny, but just as fierce. I etch how marjoram bushes feed the hummingbirds and hummingbird moths every summer. I etch how moths can grow to look just like birds, rivals and companions for eons. I also worry that no one will soon remember this. I etch the lives of my chickens in their coop, their drama and allegiance, their regard for each other, their service and their demise. I etch the way they look at me, knowing that I have food, yet often looking too much like a hungry little pack of dinosaurs. And I etch my life as a man and an animal, and I wonder about the lives I see around me. I try to see them in a greater context, try to get it all down in the hopes that someone will find my work long after I'm gone and see what a remarkable time and place this is.